<laughs> For you. Okay, shall we start? So, <clears throat> this is the third lecture of algebra number theory. So, uh, so today we're going to talk about something called ideal class group, and really talk about the failure of the unique factorization in this ring of integers of OF. So let's suppose, briefly recall what we talked about last time. So uh, F is a finite extension of Q, it's a number field, and we talked about how to define the ring of integers inside of that, namely OF. And uh, the last time we spent quite some time to talk about how a prime P factor in this bigger ring. And let's say factor is a P1, uh, E1 dot 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 PG, PG. Uh, I'm going to give you some name for these uh, exponents here. So let me be precise. For each pi, we call corresponding ei the ramification index slash degree. I don't know what. I think I've seen both. Uh, and inside of this, I want to say that if EI is bigger than 1, it's called a ramified. So say PI is ramified. And of course, if EI is 1, that's PI is unramified. OK, so that's for each PI. We can say each PI is ramified or unramified, but just talking about the exponents here. And also, for each PI, I have another invariant associated to that PI. Just like oh, z over, just like over z, you have you know if you take z ma the ideal generated by p, there you get a finite field of p elements. So in general, if you have a number field, uh, you have eight random integer, you can quotient out by this ideal pi, and this will always give you a finite field because somehow it lives over the prime p, and you probably guess it's going to have something to do with it. prime p. It's P to the fi. It's going to be some finite field, which is a finite extension of fp. The cardinality of that is fp f to the uh, is p to the fi. So so this fi, this is called is called the uh, uh, I would call it inertia degree, and some. And someone would disagree with me and call it a residual field degree. I don't know. Really, it's understandable. Both those concepts are understandable. What is fi here? Oh, the exponent here. Because this is a number. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, what is it? How is it determined from pi? Oh, yes. Thank you for that. I'll, I'll say what is the, how it's, I mean, like, you, you take the quotient. You count the cardinality of that. Yeah. And that's going to be a power of P. So what the exponent is, is that's the initial degree. Okay. I will say in a minute that you have an effective way of doing compute that. Okay? So here's a big fact. Very useful. Which is that N should be equal to the sum of product of these. Ramification D degrees and the initial degrees. So let's give it kind of a proof. But I want to enter the case where my ring of integer is explicit. Then like joining one element from the ring of integer. So like when O F is equal to O is a Z adjoint R I mean or of course or if P does not divide the difference of the two. This is precisely the, the theorem I stated last time. That in this case, I have an explicit way of computing the uh, factorization of P in this extension field. Okay, so in this case, so say HX is the uh, monic. Irreducible polynomial, monic minimal polynomial of R. Then I know that that's a 
But general theory, this is how the degree of HX is definitely n. The degree of the extension of f over q. That's because you know alpha generate f over q. And remember that in this way, in this case, we know how to factor p. Namely, if the residue, the reduction of hx mod p factors as uh, it, uh, excuse me, g x g in f p that join x. If the reduction of the minimum polynomial mod p factors as this, as, as this then that basically the ideal p factors as p join h1 x e1 all the way to p h g x e g. So that was the theorem uh, we talked about last time. That if you want to determine how p factors in this uh, ring of integer of the number field, you basically factor the minimum polynomial mod p of the a generator, and then, and it consists your prime this way. So this will be your this will be your so this will be your p one, and this will be your p g. Okay, and with this, you can use. It's not that difficult to show that in fact, if you take O f modulo p modulo h. Let me just take the first one. So that's how we want to compute what the residue field here looks like. But when you want p, and remember this OF is just really uh, nothing but just the R, the R. So I'm really looking at f, essentially, fpx modulo h1x bar. And now h1x is an uh, irreducible polynomial mod p. So this is nothing but just fp of of degree of hi, h1. So basically, the initial degree of p1 is just the degree of h1 bar. I mean, here's, yeah. And this is what we essentially it comes down to. So now, now you see that the big fact we want to prove here that n equals the sum of e i <coughs> f i. Really, let me just write. And so now, this equality is basically just saying that the degree of h bar is equal to which is, uh, I guess, E1 times the degree of H, H1 Rx E cheap. The so specific when you factor polynomial, the degree adds up. So when you, have, when you factor your polynomial Hx into the product of polynomials, the degree of H bar X will be just the sum of the degrees of each of the factors here. And the degree of each of the factor here will precisely be the initial degree of each of the primes we have over here. And therefore, you have the sum of n equals e1, f1, and all the way to e, g, f, g. Uh, just to give you a really quick example. If my f is q adjoined to d, there are three possibilities. For ramification, we call it right. That's n equals two. So when you have n equals two and you want to write a sum of EI FR. So there are three possibilities. The first possibility is that this prime P turns out to be a prime square. So that's the case when you write two n equals two as e times f, where e is two and f is just one. 
I mean, the typical, typical example is in pure join I, you have this ideal two, which is why one plus I squared. Of course, you can also have this prime P to be continue to be a prime. So that's when you again just have one prime above that. But now F turns to be two, and E is just one. Again, I'm gonna give this example in Q join I. So this is the case if P is common to three, mod four. So that's the case where this where there's initial degree is two and uh, not ramified, ramification degree is one. And finally, you can have the number the prime P to factor as two distinct primes. So P1 not equal to P2. So in this case, you have two prime factors. You get E1, F1, E2, F2. These are all one. So two equals one plus one. So this is a case when the P is really like, again, in Q join I, if P is congruent to one mod four, that's what's happening. This prime P factors to two distinct primes, or two distinct primes. So that's it. I mean, of course, if you have a general, more complicated field, you can have. I mean, this is kind of a common horror question: How do you part make n as sum of a bunch of numbers? They have pretty much all. I mean, there are some a lot of possibilities you have to consider. What can happen in general? Okay. Are there any questions? Good. So now, now let's move move on to the next topic. Uh, so called ideal class groups. So these are kind of just recap of what we learned last time, and we want to also use this opportunity to introduce the meaning of ramification degree, initial degree. So those are important concepts. Later on, when you study number theory in depth. Uh, but, uh, but now let's get, get back a little bit. So let's recall uh, our, our somehow goal, or like our goal for the, our, what we try to prove for us, or when Kumar tried to prove for us last year, is that you want to you wanna, you wanna factor. The equation is like this. Right? But then of course he ran into a problem of like Z adjoint zeta P as we've seen. In many cases they may not be a PIV. So the problem is that Z adjoint zeta P may not be a PID. So kind of the resolution we introduced last time was to was that you know we want to use the factorization of ideals instead of factorization of elements of the of the ring. But of course, at the end of the day, you, people still care about the equations. So so people still want to understand when is such ring a principal ideal domain. So here's a fact. Remember that if a ring. It's a principal for OF. Of course, any ring is a PID, then it's automatically a unique factorization domain. But for a ring, but for ring of integers, UFD turns out to be the same as a principal ideal domain. So, well, as far as Kumar is concerned, he wanted to show that, well, he wanted to really be in the case where this Z. Uh, zeta p is a unique factor in the domain so that he can, you know, one can somehow use the tricks that so we, we explained on the, on the first lecture to kind of try to attack this problem. So, uh, so the question is, in general, uh, well, the problem is in general, these rings may not be PID or UFD. So we want to ask the question, how far? Is the 
or general OF from being a principal ideal domain? I think this is kind of a very natural question. Like, the goal for this lecture is to give a kind of quantitative thing to measure how far the ring of integer is from being a principal ideal domain, and therefore but, uh, how far is it from a unique fraction domain for fashioning things into elements instead of ideals. So for this, we want to introduce something called ideal class. Called ideal class group. Some people write ideal class group of F. That's understandable. Uh, but I think technically it should be ideal class group of OF. Uh, I think usually people write it class CL, OF, defined to be the following equivalent classes of ideals of OF. We have to explain what equivalent means. Where alpha, where, where, where I have two I of non-zero ideals. Okay, I want to exclude zero. Zero is a bit different always. I want to say two ideals are equivalent. I and J are equivalent if you can find a number, two numbers, alpha and beta, in the ring of integers, not zero, such that alpha times i is equal to beta times j. So what is this? What does this say? Uh, well, maybe here, maybe I'll give you an example. Uh, so what would be a good example? Uh, So maybe I'll, I'll do this. So maybe it's set in the adjoint root to the negative five. Okay? So I have two ideals. I have two one plus root to the negative five. I want to say that. These two are sort of equivalent. But they, they, they look, don't look like each other anyways. Okay? So why is that? So this is because, uh, let's see, how did you pick uh, two numbers? So if I multiply this, like three, one plus root of negative five, with this one minus, with this one, so I will get three minus three times root of negative five. Oh, excuse me. Come on. I just multi basically multiply the out this number onto each of the generators. So I multiply on the first one, I get uh, three minus three, negative five. On the multiply on the second one, I get six. So the other one, I'm going to multiply with a different number, 3. Okay? And you see that these, these ideas are really the same. Think about it, because you have 6 here. I mean, you can replace this by, you can, you can you know, add a 6 times root of negative 5 to this one. That's another color. You can add a 6, you can add a 6 times root of negative 5 to this one. So this term will become this 3 plus 3 root of negative 5. Or you can subtract that if you want to go from this here. 
So they're really sort of the same idea. After you multiply by two principal ideals. So that somehow gives up, establish a relate, like to say what two ideals are. So, so you ask, so in some sense, like if one of the ideals I were principal, you can show that the other ideal J were also principal. So now for non principal ideals, they're sort of non principal or like they're equally far from being principal if somehow off by. Some multiplication by some principal ideals, they're sort of the same. So that's the concept I'm trying to convey here. Okay? So you can check that this is actually equivalence relation. Now, uh, so this, I said this is an ideal class group. So I will explain it as a set. So all the equivalent classes of this ideal. Now, I'm going to say group structure. The class of the principal ideals, I can take to be one, or any other uh, principal ideals. They definitely define the same class because you can you can multiply this one by alpha. That's going to be the same as the other one one time with one. So they live in the same class. So this is the uh, identity in the class group. Oh, yes. And you can multiply two ideals as we've seen before. Then in the same way you can multiply two ideal classes. If one ideal class is represented by i, the other ideal class is represented by j, just, their product will be the ideal class j represented by ij. So this is, in, this is independent of the choice of the representative you choose. And to define the inverse, we use, we use the following. So we just basically take any, uh, uh, let me write a, I, any element, uh, you can check, uh, well, it's good. since we didn't really develop things theoretically, but this would, would imply that A, uh, just like me just give an example, for example, if an ideal 2, so 4 would be in here, so that means 2 would divide 4, so that means that 4 must be equal to 2 times something else, okay? So the same philosophy works in the, in the ring of integers. In the sense that if A is a non-zero element in ideal I, then this ideal I would divide the ideal generated by A, and therefore A would be equal to I times J for some J. So therefore, in the ideal class group, you would think that, you know, that, let me just write it like this. So in fact, you're gonna have this. If everything works out, of course, this is everything requires proof. I'm not proving anything. I'm just somehow manipulating it so that it somehow it looks reasonable, right? So, so now you have the idea, like ideal generated by A equals I times J, and then therefore the ideal class for the principal ideal A will be the same as ideal class of I times ideal class of J. And remember, this the ideal class of any principal ideal is uh, is an identity in the class group. So therefore. The inverse of i is just for this j. Whatever the j that makes it work. So the upshot this is an abelian group. Because of ideal multiplication, they're committed. To. Okay? And uh, on a, like a theorem, which I won't be able to prove, it takes a lot of time to actually prove it. So for a number field, the ideal class group is always finite. This is uh, uh, this is not a trivial. This is a, this is a well, it will follow from 
with another statement I'm going to say later on. But really, this requires that things to be uh, number two. Uh, sorry. Okay. Okay. So before giving an example of how to actually compute the ideal cost group, let me say why why do we care about ideal cost group? I mean, I guess for one thing, I I kind of explain why uh, this ideal cost group measures how far. OF is from being a principal ideal domain, right? I mean, somehow, question, why do we care? Care. Well, for one thing, uh, that this measures, measures how far, uh, how far is OF from being API. This one thing. Uh, maybe I'll give you another example. This is kind of an example of why. So, so Kumar proved that. Of course, we don't know. Uh, of course, it's not. I kind of explained that. If, If the ideal cost group, maybe I should so say. So say here. So, so if the ideal cost group is trivial, it just it's trivial. If and only if OF is a PID or a slash. So if the ideal cost group is trivial, then everything's good. So in this case, we in this case definitely we know how to prove the Fermat's last theorem for that prime p. But what Kummer did is that actually as long as p does not divide the order of the ideal class group of, uh, for, for for f equals to q or join theta p, then Fermat's last theorem holds. So he really used the, this uh, ideal class group, which somehow measured how far this ring of integer of pure joint roots of p from being a PID, and really take advantage of this group structure uh, to somehow show that the Fermat class group holds for that prime p. And he realized that the only thing one needs to use is that p does not divide the ideal class group, but not any class group being trivial. That's a much more released condition. So in fact, uh, well, in fact, so uh, the adjoint theta p is a PID for only p less than 19, which is times. Whereas this condition, the other condition, so p does not divide the ideal class group uh, uh, happens for uh, all all primes less than equal to 100, except uh, three numbers: 37, 59. Of course, it's unfortunate. We don't know. So, so for, for those prime p where p does not divide the ideal class group, these are called regular primes. Uh, well, in the sense of Kumar. Uh, but we unfortunately we don't know whether there are infinite many regular primes. Uh, I'm not sure whether we should expect there to be infinite many or finite many. But again, numerically, I guess for the first first I don't know twenty something primes, we see a lot of regular primes. So. I guess this allows Kummer to prove a lot of cases for my thought here. Not all of them, of course, but... And this is a very great achievement. This is like hundreds of years back. Okay, so that's one. I hope these two are good reasons to consider these ideal class groups. Are there any questions? Good. So now, I'm giving you some 
something, I guess, similar to the other classroom. We can ask the following question. How large is I mean, in general, how far is OF from being PID? Well, here's the first zero. Our zero is for E square free. As E goes to infinity, the number of ideal clusters of the imaginary quadratic field roughly grows like root of d. So, in other words, if you look at, if you think about it a little bit more, it's very for imaginary quadratic field. It's very unlikely that the ideal class group is one. It's very unlikely you're going to get something which is a PID or unique factor of the domain. So in fact, this, is a con this was conjectured by Gauss. It's Gauss conjecture, but proved by, uh, well, proved independently by uh, Higner. Baker and Stock. That there are only nine imaginary quadratic fields which are PID. In this case, well, I can list all of them. Negative D is equal to negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, negative 5. Excuse me, no, not negative 5. You can get really large. This is a very interesting example. The largest one I guess is 160. On Wikipedia, you can you can search class group, class number for imaginary quadratic fields, and it will not Wikipedia. I think uh, sorry, Wolfram, or like you Google, and you can have a list of all the imaginary quadratic fields of class number one, class number two, and so on. Okay, and maybe also want to mention the other case. What about what about real quadratic field? So this is a conjecture of Cohen Lenstra. Uh, well, I mean, I think in, in the original paper they're assuming e to be congruent to one mod four. Doesn't really matter. Uh, the conjecture is about. Oh, oh shoot! I should prepare this. So something like this. These four digits might not be correct. About that many Q adjoint P's. Like, maybe you say, uh, yeah, Q adjoint uh, has, let me say, class number one. I.e., uh, the ring of integers, in this case, is a PI. This is a somehow a drastic. Contrast. For imaginary quadratic field, it's really difficult to get anything that's a principal idea that way. Conjecturally, for real quadratic world, on the other hand, there are, I guess, a little bit over three quarters of them should be PID, except you don't know which one. Statistically, as t goes, t goes to infinity. Unfortunately, not known, not even known. If there's there are infinite many, I think according to not even though there's infinite many number of fields. Right. 
Well, there's another infinitely in every place. Huh? There's another infinitely in every place. You told me they're not, we're, they're, we don't know whether they're infinitely in every place. You didn't complete your sentence. You said it's not known if they're infinitely in every place. What's number one? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of course <laughs> Okay. Okay. Good. Yeah, there are infinite numbers. Okay. <laughs> so yeah. If you assign each graduate student a problem about one number of you, you can have infinite many graduate students. <laughs> That's the first thing we should need to make sure. Okay, so there. I guess so. I hope you give some, give you some sense of uh, the number of this class group. I do class group. Okay, so how to compute? In practice, so I want to use a theorem. Oh, let me let me sort of recall something. This will take up some time. So remember that, recall that the degree of f over q is n, and this f has, uh, so let me, usually the number I write down, like this is a typical way of writing it. So there are r1 real embeddings, and r2 pairs of complex embeddings. Recall that the complex embedding comes in pairs. You can, you, you can come, when you embed, you can further compose with complex conjugation. So in particular, this tells you that n equals n, uh, r1 plus 2r2. OK? Uh, and with these embeddings, I can define the discriminant of OF to be the uh, the determinant of this thing. Okay. So where F1 through Rn is a D basis of OF. Okay? So these are the somehow the invariants we learned earlier on. We're gonna, there's gonna be a formula involving all these numbers. So this is a theorem of Minkowski. You show that every element in the ideal class group, remember each element in the ideal class group is an equivalent classes, is an equivalent class of ideals. So there are a bunch of ideas there. So, but you can always pick one ideal i. So every element ideal class group contains one ideal i, such that the norm of i. For now, I'm just going to define that to be the number of OF moduli. I. I'll, I'll give you more information later on. This is less than equal to a number, which is the uh, discriminant, uh, absolute value of discriminant of OF. This is a number you don't have to memorize, of course. Very few people can memorize that. Not done yet. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's, it's absolute value because discriminant may not be positive. Maybe after you, maybe you have taught, uh, maybe after you have taught algebra number theory for like three, four times, you can memorize it. Not, not for me now. Okay. This is a, this is called Minkowski bound. For number of the low degree, this turned out to be a pretty good bound. 
Okay? So I want to say a little bit more about this norm. So first of all, the norm of an ideal is multiplicative. Secondly, the norm of an, a principal ideal is basically just the norm of the generator. When you take the normal generator down to Q, you just get an integer. So you just the absolute value of that integer. And also I want to say the norm of an ideal is 1, even though if the ideal i is just generated by 1, namely the whole ideal, the whole ring of integers. Okay. So for the, for the remaining time, maybe uh, I'll do one example. Think about to actually use this theorem to compute uh, the ideal Haskell of here. So maybe I'll do. Uh, I don't have enough time. Maybe I'll just do this one. Let me do this. It's my F. And OF is the adjoint with some negative 14. Okay? So this is different from what I wrote down. Oh, I'm going to update my notes anyway. So. Uh, so the first thing to compute is compute. First step compute in Kalski's bounds. So what is the discriminant of OF? Well, this is d congruence two and three. We uh, we talk. We're given. An, I think we'll give an exercise or something as a fact that the discriminant is basically whatever is in the square root times four. So that's fifty six. And uh, what what else? Do I need? So n is 2. So n is 2. So I have a one pair of compact embedding. So R2 is 1. So that's all I need to do. And now I need to compute the bound. So that's the square root of 6 times 4 over pi to the first power, 2 factorial, 2 squared. Okay? So. Use Google or whatever. Use a calculator. No idea how to. How do you do this? <laughs> I, I didn't prepare this, but I prepared. Oh, this is 50. Shoot. Sorry. Equals to square root. Yeah, I should prepare this. 4 divided by 3. 4 divided by 2. So it tells me that. I just computed. Okay. So what I know is that although this looks complicated, I definitely every so only need to look at ideals with norm less than or equal to four. So if you want to look at ideals with less than or equal to 4, basically, they so only need to factor uh, 1, oh, there's nothing to factor about 1, and 2 and 3. 4, of course, 4 is, uh, four is 2 squared. So basically, every element in the ideal class group will be represented by some factor appearing when you factor 2 and 3, and also 1. So let's see. So for two, so remember, like let's just recall that. So step two. So this is my OF. Okay. So the minimum polynomial for 
uh, for square, uh, square root of negative 14 is x squared plus 14. To, uh, the, no, no, it's zero. That's a minimum polynomial. OK, I want, if I want to factor 2, what I want to do is I want to see, so I want to factor this mod 2. So this is just x squared mod 2. So therefore, my idea of 2 is just 2 comma root of negative 14 squared. However, I factor my multiple polynomial mod 2. It's going to give me how to factor my primes. Do the same thing for 3. So that's x squared minus 1 mod. Uh, I don't know. Just keep doing. Keep going. Mod 3, x squared plus 14 is just x squared minus 1. So you get x plus 1 and x minus 1. Now I know that 3 is equal to 3 comma uh, root of negative 14 plus 1 and root of negative 14 minus 1. So, so a priori, this ideal class group is represented by the principal idea always one, two comma square root of negative fourteen, and this vector, and this vector. Sorry. It's possible that some of these factors are the same. But it's possible. This is something you want to rule out. But at least I have, I have only basically four options. The minimum thing I, I like, the easiest thing, like, obvious thing I can do is that the size of ideal class would be less than equal to four. It's a billion group. So what could it be? A trivial at z mod 2, z mod 3, z mod 4, or z mod 2 cross z mod 2. So basically that's uh, all, I don't know how many possibilities, but that's all the possibilities. Uh, at this point, it's going to be very difficult to, in practice, it's going to be very difficult to actually compute what the ideal class group is. So it really depends on case by case. So the claim, no time, but in this case, the ideal class group turns out to be z mod 4z. Let me get as far as I can, and then we'll continue next time. So we have these options, right? So obviously, the, the obviously the uh, somehow I guess we know ahead of time that the ideal. Let's just say I, I know for some for some reason that the ideal class group is Z mod four Z for no reason, and now this is the identity element, right? And uh, I guess, what else can I see from here? Well, let's see, let's, let's know that two is this ideal square. Remember, this will represent the identity, in, this will be the identity in, in the ideal class group. So this ideal two comma root of negative 14 would be a element of order two. It would probably gonna be, I mean, like if, I guess if the order is four, then these four elements must be distinct. So you would probably want to show that this, this ideal is a genuine uh, element in the, prime, in, in the ideal class, which is not the principal one. Right? And it has order two. So the strategy is the following. One of the first step is to show that this is not a PID. And secondly, I want to show that 
So that's only giving me elements of order two. But the whole group has, a element, has elements of order four, right? Now, now we see, we have a list. Each element must be, each element in the ideal class group must be represent, represented by one of the four ideals here. So this is a, this is a, this is a uh, identity. So this is the element of order two. So the other two must be the elements of order four in the mod 4D. So basically I want to show that this one has order four. And if what we're, whatever we're claiming is correct, basically I want to show that this square is equivalent to this. And if we somehow reverse the thinking, really, somehow, if we have shown that this square is this order two element in the ideal class group, then this element would have order four. And that would show that the ideal class group is actually Zemo for Z. So let me see. If, I mean, when, when this, oh, sorry. So this should will imply that this one has order four. Okay. I guess I'm out of time, so maybe I'll continue this calculation next time. And uh, I'll do these two proofs. And then moving on to the next time. I'll stop here.